and welcome to DM's Book Club, a podcast where we read about some Dungeons and Dragons and discuss how we might include it in our role-playing campaigns. With me today, I have an incredible special guest. Um, he's written, I say so many books, but so much on D&D lore, and I've used quite a lot of his blog posts in my campaigns and stuff, so I'm very, very excited to have Keith Amand. Oh, I've said it wrong already, haven't I? <laughs> Keith Amand. Tell me, how, tell me I've said it wrong already. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, it's Amand. Amand. No Keith G. Amand. No, 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 no. <laughs> nope. Too British. I'm so sorry, Keith. How are you, my friend? How, what, I'm sorry. I'm all right, and also German. So that's where the source of the problem lies. Uh, I see. I see. Yeah. But have that light, slight frustration of us of a very posh British woman getting your name wrong constantly. So <laughs> welcome to that. Um, how are you? Obviously, you've been writing loads and stuff. You've got a new book coming out. That's pretty exciting. Mm-hmm. Yes, in November, November thirtieth, the uh, sequel to the Monsters Know What They're Doing, which is creatively titled more monsters know what they're doing nice little cover with a goblin defacing the title to paint war over it yes i love the artwork and all all the books i've I've got the first two here that they are just so beautiful and so like evocative so i'm yeah really excited oh they are i tell you i like them all but i am in absolute love with the cover of live to tell the tale um Mm. the artist leo preslin who lives in the uk uh they're scottish just knocked it out of the park Yeah, it's so amazing. We'll start at the top then. Uh, Tell us a bit about yourself then, and why did you get into writing about Dungeons & Dragons? It's what was on my mind at the time. I had recently been asked to dungeon master a D&D campaign by my wife for her and a group of her coworkers, and uh, I had just picked up 5th edition, and I had not played D &D in Mm. many 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 years i had actually not played since the advent of the second edition of the game i started off back in the 1980s playing AD&D, the first edition second edition came out i think i bought the player's handbook at the second edition i think that was the only second Mm. edition book i bought because Right about that time, I got sucked in by Shadowrun and went full Shadowrun and left D&D behind. Mm -hmm. And it was not for many, many years that I got back into D&D. And when I did, the fifth edition had just been released. Mm -hmm. And I picked up the starter set, read through the rules, and I thought, yeah, this is not going to (laughs) provide all of the character creation options that my players will necessarily want or that I would like to make available to them. Mm. So I went ahead and splurged and bought the player's handbook and the dungeon master's guide and just went in, you know, full dive. Full deep. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, was impressed by it pretty quickly because mm. coming to it from the AD and D days, I was accustomed to rules that were a labyrinthine mess. Mm -hmm. I was, that's what I was accustomed to. That's what I expected. And I was very pleasantly surprised to see how much the publishers had streamlined everything. And what's the word I'm looking for? Harmonized everything, Mm. made things work in the same way, whether it was an attack roll or an ability check or a saving throw. You no longer had to have a dungeon master screen with all of the lookup tables Mm -hmm. laid out before you, much more standardized. And I really appreciated that. So I was sold on it from the get-go. It was not in any way unclear to me what I was supposed to do with these rules. Uh, You know, I just, I could pick them up and run with it. It made it easier for me to onboard my players, most of whom, not all of them, but most of whom had no prior tabletop role-playing game experience. At the same time, because I had not played since I was 20 years old, I would get into certain situations and realize, yeah, I don't know exactly how I'm supposed to do this Mm. to make it feel right. Mm -hmm. One of the issues that I identified with the game early on, and I don't know whether this was actually an aspect of the game or just an aspect of how callow young adults played the game. (laughs) But I remembered that back in the day, the various, what I think of as the cannon fodder humanoids, 
Mm. were not really differentiated from another very clearly. Mm -hmm. It was not super clear what was supposed to make an orc different from a goblin, different from a kobold, different from a knoll or a lizard folk. They looked different. They were different sizes. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, what was different about them that would make the experience of one of encountering one feel different from the experience of encountering another. That wasn't super clear. And I started thinking, this is really something I care about. Mm. And I want to figure out how to make these encounters feel distinct from one another. And I was filled with a desire to get it right. You know, to say, okay, what is fighting a goblin supposed to feel like? What is that experience supposed to feel like? And about the same time, I was feeling pretty strongly like I needed to start writing again because I had worked for a decade as a writer and a copy editor and the bottom had kind of fallen out of publishing and I had done other things with my life for about a decade, a little more than a decade. I was thinking, I want to write again. I need to get words on paper. I need, I think my wife was encouraging me to do that too. And I thought, well, okay, a blog will, Hmm. you know, will be a good outlet for that. But one of the challenges I've always faced as a writer is figuring out what to write about Hmm. and never feeling like I had a good enough idea. But I thought I'm having these experiences with D and D fifth edition. I'm going about trying to, more or less solve them for myself. Mm. Other people might benefit from this too. And so I don't remember the exact confluence of thoughts that led to me starting the monsters know what they're doing, but they were something like that. It was a combination of wanting to get writing again and wanting to do this thing to make my dungeon mastering better and thinking that if I thought in public it, you know, other people might benefit from it. It took me a long time to realize just how much people were getting into it. And yeah. it was when I started looking at my stats and noticing that from time to time, I would get a big influx of hits and that they always seemed to correspond to somebody writing something on Reddit. And I followed those links back mm-hmm. and saw that people were answering questions like, how do I run a beholder? How do I run a this or that or the other thing? And replying to those with, oh, go read the monsters, know what they're doing. He talks Mm -hmm. about this. And realizing gradually that people were using my site as a reference work. Mm. When I was reading it, the idea that if you've got different names for different monsters, they are different. But like you said, they're having this sort of like cannon fodder like goblin after goblin, just throwing these things at people that, you know, how do you make it impact and different? They are named differently. So they have it. And I thought that was such a really interesting way of going about it. And yeah, I think interestingly, the blog version works so much better because you you encapsulate a monster, you know, what they are, you know, within like, you know, 200, 300 words, very simple stuff rather than like a YouTube video, which I think maybe people nowadays might do like a quick YouTube video about how do you play this? I think it just works so much better because you could just read through and, and get what you need out of it. Whereas maybe a video doesn't work as well, perhaps, or maybe it does a bit, I don't know, there has to be a bit more tech involved in that. So yeah, I can imagine why people just want something, a quick reference to like, well, how would you play it? And then just reading a very well-written and in simple language as well. It's not too highfalutin. It, it, you deal with concepts which are everyone will know about through either, like you said, playing strategy games or just in general, just knowing about the concepts of them. So it works really well as a result. You know, there was the tech barrier, and there's also the fact that I have done video production in my life. I have done audio production in my life. I could have done YouTube videos or a podcast, Mm. but I know how much work and how much time it takes to do those things well. Mm -hmm. I not only didn't have the money to build a studio for myself, Mm -hmm or the space, or the time. I just didn't have the time Mm. to do audio or video right. I didn't have the time. I didn't have the tools. And meanwhile, I have all of this professional experience 
as a writer and editor, exactly. I can sit down and bang out a thousand words in nothing flat. You know, I can yeah. do it in an hour, hour and a half post done, you know, edit so, briefly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Give it a, give it a quick read over, fix some of the mistakes I find after the fact, just get it out there. It, yeah. um, I can churn out written content a mm-hmm. lot faster then I can make video or audio content worth watching or listening to. And so that was my natural medium there. And it's kind of funny. I think I hit blogs at that sweet Mm. moment just before blogs were kind of ending. Like there's not, you know, a lot of the wind has gone out of the sails of blogging these days. And I think that mine only continues to, uh, to abide because people are using it as mm. a reference work. And uh, I'm not sure how much life it would have otherwise. Yeah, it's definitely a, you know, a fantastic resource. And I'm sure anyone listening to this will go and look at it as well. People learn in different ways, right? Obviously, they can either learn through reading or through a video or anything like that. But you're completely right. The cost value in terms of time rather than resources, I think, just to come up with stuff. But you could easily take your post and making that into a script you know, and something to say to camera, something you could, obviously nowadays when you have stuff like Zoom and stuff, it's very easy to capture and to, to edit and stuff, but it's just, it's oh, just yeah. so interesting. I could totally do that. And if I were starting today, yeah, I might very well have to do it that way Yeah, uh, just to get any, uh, any audience at all. Mm-hmm. But on the flip side, I don't think that it could really have become the phenomenon that it became if I did it that way, I agree. Um, like I love the guys behind web DM, Jim and mm-hmm. Pruitt. They have so many good observations. I love their style. I love their approach. Mm-hmm. I have watched maybe six or seven of their hundreds of videos. Yeah. And I, you know, <laughs> I, you don't I, have time. Well, you don't have well, time. Well, to I totally it, yeah. admire. Dale Kingsville. She recorded the best treatment of thieves can't I've ever seen period. If you've ever wondered what to do with Thieves Can't in your game, Google Dale Kingsmill. She spells it D-A-E-L, uh, Thieves Can't, and just be treated to some of the most brilliant ideas of your life. But I don't find myself going back and searching to see what she said about other things. You know, the flip side of the fact that it takes so much time and effort to produce a good podcast or a good video is that... It also takes time to listen to a podcast yep. or watch a video. Yep. Podcasts are great if you're commuting and you're stuck in your car or on the train. Mm-hmm. But um, if you are living a busy life and you don't have that commute, you know, when you can just receive information through this channel that you're otherwise not using, mm-hmm. um, it is really hard to find the time to get that information through video or audio Mm -hmm. the facebook driven pivot to video Mm -hmm. was not only murder on print but just murder on information consumption in general because you can read a thousand words in five minutes but it takes a lot more than five minutes to say a thousand words exactly yeah it's different scale and i completely agree i think since during obviously the pandemic here my listening of podcasts has dropped right down. And I think there's a a factoid that people can only keep seven podcasts in their repertoire. And any beyond that, you drop them if they're not updating or there's too many of them. or So you have all those variables as well. But you're right. I think the biggest thing is- And that's assuming you have a commute. I have no commute. I have zero (laughs) podcasts in my repertoire. Well, there there you go. (laughs) Because I, I, you know, sorry, you know, I'm I'm here on a podcast, dissing podcasts. I'm not dissing podcasts. No, Podcasts are great. I personally don't have time to listen We don't have time. But I think the key thing, we're both agreeing on this really, is that searching, like you said, you type into Google or into Reddit, you ask, and then you can find it. You can search the text. It's very hard to search a video or to a podcast, I yeah, find. You cannot skim a podcast. You cannot skim a video. Exactly. You can skim text for the bit you need. So when you go about creating one of your entries so if you've got a a new monster to analyze and stuff where do you kind of start what are the key elements you look at first well to plug my upcoming book more monsters know what they're doing (laughs) i am actually going to include an introductory section on Uh that very thing i gave a somewhat specific but not super specific breakdown of it at the beginning of the monsters know what they're doing the book Mm -hmm. 
which is adapted from the Why These Tactics page mm. on the blog. But in More Monsters, I go into more depth about it, and it's more step-by-step. -step. Essentially, I just work my way through the stat block, starting at the top. And the armor class, hit points, these have to do with at what point do monsters decide whether to stay in the fight or flee, surrender, what have you. Mm -hmm. How much do they care about opportunity attacks, alignment? What is their initial um, attitude? Are they hostile, indifferent, friendly? The ability scores give a sense of their character in terms of combat, their combat style, their combat role, whether they prefer to use tooth and claw and blade or cast spells, whether they are going to plunge into melee engagement or try to avoid it, dart in and out or shoot from a distance. Mm -hmm. Senses, if they can see in the dark and you can't, they're going to attack you at night because that's when things are better for them and worse for you and so forth. And just working my way down through the stat block, looking for synergies, looking for combinations, looking for anything that gives a sense of the style or flavor mm -hmm. of fighting this creature. For example, goblins, first entry on the blog, first entry in the monsters know what they're doing in the book. Nimble escape is central mm -hmm. to running goblins because nimble escape is the feature that tells you they can hit and run and hide mm -hmm. and gives them a mechanical way to accomplish that. And that tells you a few things. It allows disengaging or hiding mm. as a bonus action. So it means if they shoot at you and then hide as a bonus action, you don't know where they are in between turns. So you lose your turn and mm -hmm. then they get another one. Mm -hmm. It means that if they are in melee and they don't want to be in melee anymore, they can disengage and get out of it. So... These are creatures that don't really want to be in melee. They have mm -hmm. a short sword, but they're never going to use it unless they're in close quarters or they have to. Mm -hmm. You know, that also, uh, the fact that their dexterity is going to be their primary offensive ability and not their strength, that also tells you that they are not looking for a toe-to-toe -to -toe fight. Mm -hmm. They are, they're slippery. Mm -hmm. And so fighting goblins should be slippery. And this is a big contrast from AD&D. Mm -hmm. One time out of just curiosity, I went back to the AD&D monster manual and said, what do they say about <laughs> goblins? Did they have nimble escape all those years ago and I just didn't know about it? Mm -hmm. No, they didn't actually have any of that. In the original monster manual, the thing that most characterized goblins was the fact that they like to take slaves. Hmm. Charming. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. <laughs> not a, not at all a guide to like how they might behave tactically. Yeah. Yeah, not all that tasteful combat. either, as yeah. we said, of a lot of things from AD&D when you go back and look at them. So you talked a bit about alignments there as well. I know it features uh, quite a bit in sort of the monsters know what they're doing in general, sort of like as an attitude, you sort of said. With Tasha's coming out, it's as like they've kind of thrown alignment out the window would you say alignment is important for when you're thinking about tactics for any monsters or is it are you just like it doesn't yeah matter no much? i would the climate and the culture of the game are changing in some pretty fundamental ways mm -hmm. and i get the motivation behind these changes i personally think that sometimes they take on a bit of a throwing out the baby with the bathwater character, mm -hmm. that sometimes they attack the symptom rather than the disease. In the case of alignment, why even use a word like alignment to describe what we're talking about when we talk about alignment? Mm. And the reason is that D&D &D was born out of miniatures wargaming. The role-playing came later. Originally, it was a miniatures combat game. And alignment referred to which side you were aligned with. Okay. Which side are you fighting on? 
This is a battle of good versus evil. Which forces are on the good side? Which forces are on the evil side? Alignment tells you elves in a battle of good versus evil will fight on the good side, but in a battle of law versus chaos will fight on the chaos side. Druids are neutral. What does that mean? Well, later on, it evolved into this notion of uh, the balance of all things in the Mm. natural world, maintaining that delicate equilibrium. What it meant in the beginning was if you have a battle of good versus evil or a battle of law versus chaos, your druid's like, nope, I'm out. Yeah. Do this yourselves. I, this is not my. I'm good. Yeah. No dog in this fight. (laughs) Yeah. The first time I remember seeing it was in second edition. Alignment became a description of personal morality and psychology. Mm. Probably because people weren't fighting those pitch battles with the lines clearly drawn anymore. They were um, playing individual player characters who might be Mm. lawful neutral or chaotic good or whatever. And okay, so what does this mean for my character as a person? Mm. Lawful neutral is is the very orderly functionary, bureaucrat who wants to follow all the rules to the letter and so forth. It's like, okay, okay. Chaotic good is your uh, rebel, your revolutionary, your iconoclast. Sure, nothing wrong with that. Actually, no. that's kind of cool because what you value and how you think are closely intertwined and are going to influence who and what you're willing to fight for. Mm-hmm. It got a little bit rigid, and Mm. I think people reacted against the rigidity, and they definitely reacted against the idea that all members of a sentient species would share the same Mm. alignment, which is clearly contradicted not only by the existence of PCs of many different alignments, but also by reality. Yeah, you know, absolutely. you know, over here we have, well, for us, it would be a, an institutionalist centrist Democrat. And over here we have a libertarian type, you know, we're going to have some differences in alignment there. Yeah, definitely. I think people found alignment to be too limiting. Mm-hmm. And I think that people, as they started ascribing more human psychology, not Mm. just to humanoid creatures in the game, but to other creatures in the game, Mm -hmm. started thinking, well, this idea that all members of a particular species have the same alignment is ridiculous. And I think now I'm of two minds Mm -hmm. on it, because on the one hand, when you have sentient creatures... And I think sentient creatures are really the only ones who would care about alignment for the Mm -hmm. most part in the sense of cause, in the sense of values, and not just in the sense of faction. Yeah. Although also to some extent in the the sense of faction. Yeah, of course, there's going to be some variability. And the more sentient they are and the more morally developed they are, the more variability there's going to be. But at the same time, what are fiends if they're not evil? Mm Mm-hmm. I I didn't know that thing about the alignment, uh, sort of where it came from originally. So that's really interesting, that sort of word. And it's been brought back into the game, only now they call it faction, and it's not binary. It's multilateral. You Mm. know, you have the factions of the Sword Coast, you have the Lord's Alliance, the Mm. Harpers, the Order of the Gauntlet, and so forth. And I I published a uh, little thing on the Dungeon Masters Guild called We See It Differently, which is about taking those factional conflicts and building good adventures and good stories around them, mm. uh, around their differences in values and priorities and worldview. So you have um, some, the politics and stuff yeah. like the Sword Coast. Yeah. That, and that, so that now it's not, are you aligned with good or evil? Now it's, are you aligned with the Lord's Alliance? Are you aligned with the Emerald Enclave? But they don't call it alignment now, they call it faction. Uh, But I think that alignment makes an interesting proxy for things like attitude in a social interaction encounter, because for a long time, I personally have equated good and evil with being other centered and 
generally free of neurosis Mm. and being violently self-centered and carrying tons of neurosis and acting out on it in ways that harm others. I don't think that that needs to be thrown out. No, I completely agree with that. I think that characterizing at least an individual creature as either adhering to rules or disdaining rules and either caring very much about others and the well-being of others and one's relationship with others or not caring about those things at all and being willing to abuse others for one's own gain or psychological Mm -hmm. satisfaction. These are perfectly reasonable things Mm -hmm. to incorporate. And as the DM, you can always make exceptions. You can always make exceptions. I'm not sure why Wizards of the Coast thought it was necessary to tell people they could make exceptions. Maybe they included it just as a retort to more rigid traditionalist thinkers Mm -hmm. who were following it extremely rigidly and thought that you couldn't make exceptions. I don't know. I think that's it. It's like that sort of thing where, well, it's in the book. That's how that's how we play and stuff. Even though, as you just said, you are in control of your session. You're the person at the end of it that goes, yes, no. And I think it's really interesting. I agree. Like with lawful and chaotic, that feels more natural, I guess. That I see that as a more thing. Whereas there's so much loaded in the words good and evil, and people have their own view of it. And I it's I, I definitely see alignment and quotation marks there, but like um, yeah. Yeah. chaotic versus lawful is a much more interesting way of looking at it rather than good and evil. Cause I feel like, I don't know, like, cause again, like, like when you talked about that sort of the idea of that self-centeredness and neurosis that could easily attain to like the knight who thinks, well, I'm saving these people. Look at me. You know, that's, I'm great as a result thinking they're doing good when they're not, mm-hmm. or, you know, so when I, they're I doing like it for their own psychological satisfaction, exactly. Their so, own ego. Yeah. Mm. They're not necessarily really good. They're probably more neutral. Yeah, exactly. Maybe even evil if they're burning down the village in order to save it. Uh, The moral psychologist Jonathan Haidt came up with his schema of what values people elevate. And he had the justice and fairness axis, the care harm axis, in-group loyalty, deference to authority, and uh, sanctity and purity, and was arguing for a long time that liberals tended to elevate fairness and justice and care and harm over all of the others, to care very much about those two and not particularly care about in-group loyalty, deference to authority, purity, sanctity, whereas conservatives tended to hold up all five. Mm -hmm. Um, I think a lot of what we've seen in the last 10 years or so since he came out with that proposition have shown that a lot of self-styled conservatives, maybe maybe true conservatives, hold all five in mm. equal regard. A lot of self-styled conservatives who are really reactionaries care about fairness and justice and care and harm only within their own in-group and not at all outside that group. And so really are much more fixated on purity, sanctity, deference Mm -hmm. to authority and in-group loyalty. Given my attitudes toward being uh, other-centered, you can kind of (laughs) guess where I'm likely to to draw some of these lines. Mm -hmm. But like deference to authority, I think, is probably less a good evil trait and more of a law chaos trait. Mm -hmm. I think so too. But I think fairness and kindness are definitely good evil traits. Mm -hmm. I'm going to plant my flag there. I I, do. I think they are, (laughs) they are good evil traits. And Mm -hmm. if you are perpetrating injustice and perpetrating harm in the world, whatever your justification, uh, you cannot call yourself good aligned. Yeah. Agreed. That was a bit of a tangent. Oh, thank you. I appreciate it. it well, no, I, but I think it's interesting because that that is kind of like the topic of the moment, isn't it? Like this whole idea of like, you know, not attributing negative things to uh, previously 
sort of scene. Oh which yeah, is, you know oh, yeah. all that sort of thing. But it's I think oh it's yeah, and some of it it's astonishing how much of that actually did still make it into fifth edition. Yes, the one that just leaped out at me and made me wonder how in the world did this make it to print are the characterizations of half orcs in the player's handbook Pretty and bad, orcs it? in the monster manual and mm-hmm. in Volos. Yeah. Just, I mean, it does not require a great deal of sensitivity to language mm. to see just how blatantly these are derived from mm-hmm. existing real world racist stereotypes. Mm-hmm. And I've been kind of on a personal mission to recharacterize orcs as very misunderstood by other folk mm-hmm. uh, for about 30 years, you know, so I do not need to be persuaded um, <laughs> that d d needs to uh, take a new view toward how it mm-hmm. how it characterizes. I will say races because it's the in-game term, but actually I think calling it race was one of the biggest mistakes D&D made Agreed. in the very first place. It is such a fundamental mistake because it leads to countless errors in thinking because it makes people think of D&D race in the same terms as real world race, which mm-hmm. is a fiction, a social construct yeah, enforced is. by law and culture. Mm -hmm. But, you know, so there's now this very strong push against Mm bioessentialism, which is just a tiny, tiny bit off the mark. I think that's a fair comment. You know, it's not wrong to oppose bioessentialism, but certain things are being identified as bioessentialist. And I'm like, oh, are they? Because the differences in human races are based on lies. But D&D, quote unquote, races are actually different beings. They're not just all humans with wildly differing morphology. And also, if their morphology is wildly differing, like, isn't that sort of justifying Mm. some of the differences that are being criticized as bioessentialism? I really think that different folk in D&D should be viewed as different species and there shouldn't be half elves. There shouldn't be half orcs. I mean, those are only in the game mm-hmm. because of Tolkien. Mm-hmm. But Tolkien himself is criticized as introducing a lot of the problematic elements that plague the game now, like yep. the characterizations of orcs, which Jay Mendes Hodes correctly points out as being rooted in some really ugly anti-Asian stereotypes. And, Mm -hmm. you know, now in fifth edition, we have some of those ugly anti-Asian stereotypes being mixed with some very ugly anti-Black stereotypes. And it's like, you know, okay, yeah, that is clearly racist. But is it racist to say a different species that is eight feet tall has a plus two to strength? That I'm not so sure about. It's a minefield. It's a big minefield. And it's really easy to lose the thread um, by wanting to identify yourself with a certain set of values and propositions, which in and of itself may be very noble. Mm -hmm. But I I definitely think that when you try to solve these problems, Mm -hmm. You need to identify the real problems and Agreed. solve those. And I'm not sure that Tasha's did that. Interesting. I think the I think the rules in Tasha's missed the mark. And I have seen other attempts to solve these problems. And I think that they have missed the mark. And I have tried to solve this problem myself. Mm-hmm. And I think I've missed the mark. Or yeah. I flatter myself to think I may have come a little bit closer, <laughs> but I'm not there yet. I no. fully admit that. I, I, I have not solved this problem entirely. I think there's a huge desire. I would go so far as to say movement right now. Yes. To basically say that stories about other folk in D&D are all stories about being human, that they are all about mm. different ways of being human in the world. And I'm like, well, that's a good thing. 
I'm not debating that. Mm -hmm. But to me, the more interesting question is if you are creating a fantasy folk like the elves who live for more than 700 years, Mm -hmm. how do you role play that difference? Mm -hmm. How do you role play the difference of being someone who literally has watched everything going on around them for centuries? Mm -hmm. How is that going to affect that being's outlook on the world? It's going to be very different different from the usual you know, live to 80 years old human outlook. I'm playing a, uh, in a game, I actually getting to play in a hey, game, hooray. which is kind of, kind of rare. Yeah. Uh, I'm playing in a game right now in which I am playing an Aladrin elf. Oh, Aladrin's is so cool. They are, they who are is so actually beautiful. from the Feywild. Yeah. Oh, they're and, so beautiful. Yeah, um, the artwork of it is so good and they're so interesting as well. Yeah. And what's interesting about that to me is the fish out of water playing the Aladrin as someone with a really alien outlook on things. Mm -hmm. He goes to this place called the Feathered Market, which is run by Kenku, and they buy and sell all of these objects that are charged with personal significance. Mm -hmm. And that's what gives it value to them. And my character, Laureanar, he understands that immediately. He not only understands it, but he's like, okay, I know, I know how to give them something that they will value mm-hmm. to, to win their cooperation. But like, he doesn't get this whole day and night thing. It drives him crazy. <laughs> it's like, it's day, then it's night. Then it's day, then it's night. Like, make up your mind. And it's like, it's like this, it, it's, it's just so repetitive. It's like, you got this many hours, then this many hours, then this many hours. And he's just like, doesn't this drive you crazy? It's like somebody banging on a pot relentlessly. It's just boom, 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 <laughs> boom. And the other characters say, well, don't you have night and day where you come from? He's like, well, yeah, of course we do. But it's more like weather. Mm. So those are the things that I find really interesting to explore. How can this essentially alien creature Mm-hmm. among these other player characters mm-hmm. make common cause with them. Yeah. And how is his outlook going to influence how the group solves problems? See, to me, that is the really cool mm. exploration of yeah. fantasy role playing is how different can you get without completely detaching yourself? Absolutely. And I think you're right. I think sort of like this is around the sort of piece of, I agree. I think we are making progress with all these D&D things and stuff will, in 10 years time, will surpass anything that we've done recently, you know, and, and I'm sure there'll be more topics of conversation and stuff, but I think it's so important that we keep striving to be better and to revise and go ahead. And like, it's so great that, yeah, sure. Wizards have put out tasks, but it's not worked for everyone. And that yeah. you said you've done your own stuff and there are other people and we're all trying everyone is trying. And I think that's so important because sometimes people just, they just go, I just need the book. You know, and that's how they play their game. It's like, I just had what's in the book. They don't want to make it better, even if they're aware that some of it is broken or anything like that. Or it's, it's not great, as you sort of said. So I think it's so interesting how there's almost like a, and I've, I've said this before on the podcast, it's like, yeah, you said, there's this obviously the call to be like, we need to be better and demanding that from wizards to an extent, which I think is true, but also I think comes from ourselves. And I do think the books do empower us to do that, but I think when we need to go out and make it happen in our games. And like you said, like do the research, make our own stuff and try and try and be willing to fail. Cause other, if you, if you don't, you will never learn. And I think there's that, that worry about like, if you don't try these things, I don't know, you just don't, you don't learn. And that's so, such an important thing about all RPG systems, I think, is the willingness to try something and or make something different and, and try it, whether it is about, like you said, uh, races or ancestry or lineage or any of these things. It's about revising it constantly. And I think some people don't want to do that work. And I yeah, understand I that. I think there's no, there's no question that there is quite a bit of stuff here that needs to be fixed. Yeah. And at the same time, I don't think that anyone has yet arrived at the final answer about the right way to fix them. And I don't and think they'll ever will, to be honest I don't with you. Think, I don't think we should be contemptuous of the effort. It no. is a necessary effort. But I don't think we should be overly reverent of some of the solutions that have mm-hmm. been 
proposed so far either. Definitely. To move away from such a deep topic, but we, I mean, absolutely fascinated to talk to you about it, but has there been a particular standout monster that you've d- done an entry for or a couple of monsters or any memorable ones that you've gone, these are amazing or some that you think are oh, maybe overused perhaps and you're like, they're not as good as people say they are. Oh, I don't know about overused. Uh, I haven't really, I, number one, I don't know what other people use. Uh, I'm not going to, I'm not going to judge uh, people's choices that way. Fair enough. Uh, I will say that the, the ones I have found most interesting were the ones that surprised me. Mm-hmm. And there's one standout in each book in the monsters know what they're doing. It was the Zorn. Once oh, I realized so cool. what the Zorn <laughs> could do yeah. some of the, dirty, dirty tricks that Zorn can play in combat. I was giddy. I was grinning like an idiot <laughs> thinking, man, you could, you could just mess with people so badly with a Zorn and things could go so sideways based mm-hmm. on little misunderstandings with them. It could, yeah. be, it could be a very weird, but ultimately harmless encounter. Mm-hmm. But if it became a combat encounter, it could also just be like, how can he do this? What is yeah. Ah, you know, um, absolutely. <laughs> dirty. In more monsters, uh, mm. it's the GIF. The GIF is so cool. Oh, yeah. The thing that really intrigues me about the GIF is they, they just have an odd build. You know, sometimes mm-hmm. there are stat blocks that all point toward one thing to the extent that there is only one particular, almost mechanistic sequence that you want to follow with these monsters. But then there are ones that have internal contradictions, like the Balhanna has some internal mm-hmm. contradictions. Oh, there's, I forget exactly which one it is, but like one of the Dwergar that's a psionic shock attacker has some oh. weird internal contradictions that make it a little bit hard to figure out what you're supposed to do with that monster. Mm-hmm. The GIF have some have some of that internal tension that makes them fight differently on offense than they do on defense. Hmm. They've got two different modes. A group of GIF defending a location are going to behave differently from a group of GIF charging a location. Hmm. And I thought that difference was really neat. Trying to figure out, um, okay, so here's a monster species, a creature type, that based on its ability scores, you would expect it to be a melee attacker. Yeah. But they use guns. Okay, how does that work? How does it make sense for them to use guns when a lot of their stat block points to having them fight in melee? Solving that problem was was interesting and a lot of fun for me. Yeah, the, we've done an episode on the GIF and obviously the whole history of the, the GIF Zari and the GIF Yankee and how. Oh, no, no, not the GIF. Not the GIF. Oh, the, oh. the GIF. The ah, hippo. The heads. hippos. Right. Yes. I understand now. Yes, they are incredible. <laughs> they are. Again, the image of them is amazing. Just a, sort of a, with the, just huge and the guns and stuff. Yeah. Oh, they're so good. And I, I am glad. They are currently only a sort of a, like you said, a sort of a, a, a creature to put into combat rather than a playable character. Because mm-hmm. I think I know they, obviously they were originally in um, a, a Spelljammer as a as a playable race, and I know people really want Spelljammer to come back as a setting, and they want to play GIF. And I'm just like, I love them because they're so ridiculous and so silly and and so fun. But, but yeah, like you said, with the, with the guns and then and obviously huge big hippo men essentially. I wonder if playing that sort of character would become sort of a bit one note, a bit tiresome after like a, a couple of sessions or something like that. So I, I, I don't see the this nostalgia for them. I see the, the coolness <laughs> of having them in your game as a sort of a fleeting character moment, if you see what I mean. I, I think, I actually think one could have a lot of fun with a GIF PC. I do think it's, well, I personally don't quite get D's obsession with over and over creating a new folk by taking a human body and sticking an animal head on top of it. It's and very Doctor I, Who, isn't it? <laughs> and I certainly don't think that like after we've done cats, eagles, lions, turtles, that the next one in line was necessarily going to be a hippo. <laughs> 
but once you've got them in more monsters, I uh, I characterize them as the players who showed up to the con dressed to play diplomacy rather than D and D. Amazing! What an image. Uh, <laughs> but I think. Well, I certainly think that you could play the hell out of a GIF as an NPC mm-hmm. and uh, playing them as a, as a PC. You just got to find some way to justify why on <laughs> earth are these hippo-headed humanoids here? Mm-hmm. How does it even begin to make sense? Yeah, having, um, having one in the party is, is sort of like, you're like, why are you here with us? Because obviously they, they like being with their own kind. You know, it's that- well, maybe they do, maybe they don't. I mean, there are, there are always loners. There are True. always loners. There are always weirdos. Mm-hmm. Um, there are always people who did not quite fit in where they came from. Um, you know, and I think I, you know, going back to the whole bioessentialism and are all folk essentially reskinned humans, or do they really have deep underlying differences that mm-hmm. that should be reflected in game? I do think that the idea that there are individuals who just don't fit in where they came from Mm. to such an extent that they felt like they had to leave Mm. is such an important thing to reflect in the game because that is an experience that so many players have. Yeah, definitely. You've sort of said your blog is aimed at all kinds of DMs, you know, whether they're just starting or if they're, you know, advanced or even players. Because I I quite liked it where you said, like, the players should know what they're up against. (laughs) Like, you're going to throw all these things at them. But I guess if someone was going to run their first D&D campaign, is there any particular advice you would give them? I'm going to go from all this philosophical stuff to directly to brass tacks. Make as many decisions as you can make before the game session begins Mm -hmm. because you have so much to keep track of during the game session. The fewer decisions you have to make on the fly, the better decisions you're going to make. If you can't with absolute certainty say X is going to happen, at least give yourself rules. If X, then Y. Things that you can follow mechanistically so that you don't have to think about them. Just trigger condition, boom, do this. Oh, here's a uh, here's a trap with a certain DC to detect it. Don't have players roll in game, or don't don't wait until the game session and say, uh, "What's your passive perception? What's your passive perception?" You've got access to your players' character sheets, especially if you're using something like D and D Beyond. Mm-hmm. Look it up. Yeah. Know know your players' characters' passive perceptions. Oh, Tola's got observant. She's got a, a passive perception of 22. She notices, She just notices the DC 20 t- trap. Know that before the game. And then in the game, you just say, hey, Tola, you look over here, and this is what you see. Mm-hmm. I am a big, big, big fan of Mike Shea's Return of the Lazy Dungeon Master. Mm-hmm. And what I like best about it is that it really focuses your attention on the kind of prep that is going to pay off the most in the game session. Mm -hmm. But that being said, there are certain things that I prep for and that I would advocate prepping for that he doesn't. And this mechanical stuff is one of them. If there's an if-then condition and it is possible for you to know the result of that condition before the game starts, do it yourself. Don't wait until the moment because that's another thing you have to keep track of. Mm -hmm. The fewer things you have to keep track of during the game session, and especially during a combat encounter when the fur is flying, the better decisions you'll make, the smoother everything will go. We all want our game and especially our combat to be high speed, low drag. Agreed. So removing these speed bumps will go a long way to making the session feel good. And I would say that is also advice that players should take, especially players who have spells to cast or features that have options like the Battlemaster's maneuvers or the arcane archers enchanted arrows Mm -hmm. make rules for when you are going to do these certain things if you are playing a wizard and you've got a thick spell book okay you've got all these spells know when you should cast each spell what Mm -hmm. situation is this one right for 
lots of small low hit point monsters or a crowd of commoners that you need to clear out of the way, that's what sleep is for. If yeah. that is not your situation, don't even look at sleep. Don't consider it. It is not relevant to the situation. You do not need to ask yourself, should I cast sleep now? Just nope, 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 nope. Maybe group your spells according to the kinds of applications yeah. that you have for them. I'm not a great chess player, <laughs> but I do play chess. Uh-huh. There's a very, very good instructional writer uh, named Dan Heisman who um, – gave me the single most valuable tool in my entire chess playing toolkit, which is a heuristic for thinking about your move on each turn. And it's basically the first thing you should do is, can my opponent give me check? Can my opponent mm. capture anything of mine or unleash a tactic on me, a tactical combination? If the answer to any of those three things is yes, I do not have the full freedom to do what I wanted to do on this move. I have to address the threat first, and I can only consider moves that address that threat. Any other move I might consider is irrelevant to the situation. It's asking for trouble. Hmm. I have to look for something that blocks the check. I have to look for something that prevents the capture, or maybe that allows me to exchange pieces and come out ahead. So, so the, the moves you're thinking about in chess are referred to as candidate moves. A move that does not solve one of these immediate problems should not be a candidate move. You can just disregard it. It's not important right now. Do not waste time thinking about it. The same thing applies to spells or maneuvers or what have you mm -hmm. in combat that don't apply to the situation you are in in combat. Disregard don't waste time considering them because you're not just wasting your time. You're wasting the time of your fellow players and your dungeon mm -hmm. master. I really, I really um, like that. I like that like you said, like, because I, my always thing is like, know what your spells are, but actually grouping them into situational things. I think that's so clever. And I, I like, obviously we play with the rule that when you level up, you can switch out certain spells if you want as a mm -hmm. thing. So I think that's really interesting because you could be, you know, in the middle of a big campaign arc, but half your spells aren't useful. But obviously talking to your DM about yeah. it, you could do it. But yeah, I think that's so clever. Obvious, I guess. But some people just obviously roll up to the game and you know get into it. But actually thinking about it and making those smart moves, certainly when you get up to higher levels, you know, when you're into your level 15 plus combat where it matters, you know, you have to have a game plan per se because it's world ending combat so yeah oh fantastic really really yeah write yourself a little playbook on an index card or get one of those uh paper field notes notebooks and mm -hmm. especially if, if you are a spellcaster with a spell book like this is your spell book this is the player's spell book this tells you what the applications of each of your spells are for your own reference take a little time to do that because i see that and all the advice i give and live to tell the tale Yes. Yeah. As a way of role playing your character's competence mm -hmm. and their understanding of their role in the party and what they do as a member of their class. There are a lot of people out there who see combat and role playing as polar opposites yeah. on a spectrum. Mm -hmm. I don't I don't want to think about combat because I'm a role player. Mm. Well, your character engages in combat for a living, at least part of the time. Mm. Role playing them as an individual who engages in combat in part entails thinking about combat the way they would think about combat. Are they just stumbling blindly through the world, swinging randomly, casting spells willy nilly without mm. regard for whether they'll be successful or not? No, they oh, no, are yeah. in a dangerous profession. <laughs> yeah. They're trying not to get cacked off. <laughs> they are very concerned with how they can do what they need to do in order to not die. Exactly. And, you know, combat is, is do or die. So knowing how your character does is part of understanding that character. It's every bit as much a part of understanding that character as knowing their favorite food or the uh, the name of the romantic rival who they have a grudge against or whatever. 
Well, unfortunately, we've run over time. Unfortunately, I have to bring this uh, this wonderful chat to an end. Thank you so much, Keith, for being honest and and, and actually open and, and just talking about all these random topics that are just in my head. Um, I guess just to sign off, where can we find your works? Any upcoming products? I know we've we've sort of alluded to one, but you know, what, what have you got coming up this year? My books are published by Saga Press, which is a trade publisher. It's an imprint of Simon and Schuster. So. My books are The Monsters Know What They're Doing, Combat Tactics for Dungeon Masters, Live to Tell the Tale, Combat Tactics for Player Characters, The Upcoming More Monsters Know What They're Doing, and I'm working on a book titled How to Defend Your Lair. Oh, amazing. And all of these uh, are available at trade bookstores, uh, independent bookstores, I guess in the UK, it'd be Waterstones, Mm -hmm. Amazon UK. I have a few titles on the Dungeon Masters Guild. Just search for my name. If you want to buy through your local game store and they don't have a relationship with a book distributor, they can order wholesale through Simon & Schuster Distribution. Amazing. Thank you so much for coming on and talking to me about all this stuff, Keith. I really, really appreciate it. And Thank you uh, for inviting me. No worries. Thank you. Thank you very much.